Hey guys, um, well my next project is revisit of a project that I kind of sort of abandoned uh, a couple of years ago, back in 2012. So it's my SC Labs uh, SM112 uh, scope. Um, and watching Art Hollingsworth go through his current project um, kind of inspired me with the level of determination he's showing and he is making progress step by step um, and I thought I gave up too easily on this guy um, and so time to get it back out have a look and uh, fix what I believe is the one remaining problem on it essentially about 20 odd years ago or more 22 years ago when I uh, moved here uh, this guy didn't survive the trip um, and so I didn't use it for a while once I got here but one day when I did plug it in there was a big loud bang and lots of smoke uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah pretty dramatic so I left it I just put it away and didn't touch it for a long time then a couple of years ago I thought meh let's see if we can get this guy sorted out because it's a nice scope and when I used to use it before it was very handy um, and so Essentially the power supply had gone gone crazy. It had been repaired multiple times in the past rather badly and so again you'll see in the previous clips if we go back and have a look that um, I got everything sorted out except the triggering and so the symptom is that for both input channels <clears throat> it's not able to trigger trigger on the signal itself. So if I set if I have a signal going into channel one and I set the trigger to channel one, you get nothing. There's no trace. If I set it to auto trigger, if I just pull on the auto, so the free running oscillator does it, I get a trace. But of course, it's not locked. Um, if I take the same signal that's going into channel one or channel two and at the same time feed it into the external trigger input and select external trigger on here, I get a perfectly locked trace. So my initial assumption was, well, since the problem is on both input channels, it's unlikely to be in the channel amp side of things, much more likely to be on the, uh, on the triggering time base side of things. And so <clears throat> I went looking there first. Um, and unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> what I discovered is it's... Uh, so if I... I'm going to try and show you some of this documentation. Unfortunately, I don't have the documentation in electronic format. I have the original service section of the uh, of the manual, um, which I am very fortunate to have because there was no reference to this anywhere online. And finally, just uh, on the off chance, I asked one of these uh, places that sells... Uh, manuals and stuff and they actually had one. They didn't have part one but they had part two and part one is ostensibly the operating instructions and so hopefully I can scoot by on that one. Um, <clears throat> so I have the documentation which has got large pull out original drawings and I, as I say I feel very fortunate to have these but um, the problem is there are so many circuit diagrams and block diagrams and they all interface and go off between one and the other. It's really hard, at least for me, to keep in my head the flow of the signals um, because you're following it along and then it says from here it goes to some other drawing somewhere else. Um, anyway, here is the block diagram of the time base uh, setup. And so as you can see you have your trigger source which is selected by a switch. Then you have the trigger coupling, whether it's AC, DC, whatever. Then you input buffer and then it goes off to the to the rest of the circuitry. So obviously here, um, this switch here selects channel 1, channel 2, um, uh, external, external divided by 10, or line. Okay, so there. And so the fact that a signal coming right in here to the trigger source means everything works perfectly. I'm assuming everything downstream here is working because it doesn't... From here on, it doesn't really know where the signal is coming from, and as I said, the fact that the external one works. So, 
there are only a couple of components here and the switch itself that you need to check so I've checked them and they're okay although there are some confusing discrepancies in the in the paperwork and the drawings but we maybe get to that or not so um the next step was to say okay it's nothing in here this has got to be okay um because the mechanical switch continuity all checks out okay and as i say once you feed it from the external end she she goes she goes fine so it has to be in the other module on this thing, which is the two uh, input channel amps, etc. So I thought, I gotta go look there. So uh, let's go there and have a look. Okay, so um, some of the, of the drawings in, in, the, in the book I can scan, and, but most of them are way too big. But anyway, um, so I'll probably have to like photograph them or something and then see if I can make them into usable uh, electronic versions Because uh, having to spread this thing out over the bench takes up too much room. Anyway So this is a, m a diagram of the of basically the um, the Y amplifier module uh, In block diagram format. So you have your channel 1 and channel 2 and They're you know attenuated and preamped and booked and whatever and over here is the critical part um, so over here, as well as going off to the output amps and stuff, it's also tapped off to two trigger preamps and amps. So you have a, an amplifier and a preamp here for each channel. And then these go off to the trigger out, um, off to the time base module. They may go lots of other places. It's so hard to tell. But I thought, okay since there is a separate tap off here of the signals um, just for triggering then I gotta go look here okay so when I went and looked in the circuit board for this which is this one and incidentally this circuit board is gonna be uh, like a total nightmare to work on um, and I'll show you why in a bit because all, pretty much all the other circuit boards in the scope are designed in such a way that all the cables, the connecting wires are on one side and then there's a hinge on the other side so you can hinge the board out, get out both sides to do proper servicing, which is really neat. This board is the exception. So wh whoever designed this was not on the same team as the others. Um, and in fact, I'd say he was tripped out of his head when he did this and I'll show you why later. Anyway, so um, this down here is the trigger preamp uh, for each channel um, and what I had discovered earlier on but I didn't actually pay too much attention to it is I found two badly burned resistors on this board um, and I'll show you where these two resistors if you like fit in things in a moment but basically this is the uh, the amplifier output and these two guys and these two guys over here are the uh, sorry 59 and 61 are the preamp and 62 and 63 is the amp as far as I remember um, and yeah so um, since these two guys were badly burned um, I went and had a look um, so this is like a circuit diagram then of this I don't know if you're able to pick this out in the camera but hopefully you are so here are the two resistors that are badly overheated and so they're fed with 60 volts coming in here um, into the uh, to the preamp stage and then to the amp stage uh, and then off out to the uh, time base module um, so obviously these guys either got blasted with something very higher than 60 volts here or anyway they, they sunk way more current than than was expected um, so I did back last time out just because I saw them as being burned I did replace them uh, and they haven't burned again so obviously whatever happened this situation is, is changed now so either it was excessive uh, if you like, uh, supply came in here on the 60 volt line 
and because the power supply all got sorted out, that problem is no longer there. Or something along here literally burned itself open, and so the path that caused the overcurrent is, is gone. So, my next plan is to basically check out this whole section here and see um, and see what we can find out. Um, so my output signal should be here on this test point. My 65 volts. Fortunately, there's a lot of test points, some of which are marked on the board and some are not. Some are marked on the drawings and some are not. Um, you just gotta, if you like, uh, do the best that you can and uh, muck, muck through, as they say. So, uh, and incidentally, the equivalent of these two resistors on the other channel are also burned and they're still in there and I'll show them to you and you can see why they're still in there <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, so that's my plan. Get one channel working. Um, hopefully. Uh, I'm hoping it's in this area. But of course uh, this stuff is connected all over the place. So, And these are these are the sort of things that cause me the endless frustration because this line here goes off and somewhere at the bottom here it just says to sheet for whatever location something else and you go off and it's a completely different circuit and, <laughs> and yeah anyway gonna start here um, so I'll show you why this is likely to be physically a challenge to work on so fortunately these modules are just plug in and so they, uh, they unplug you unscrew them and they unplug and you have these um, big connectors on the back, so it's got a sort of a primitive back plane on the back. Um, so I'll just tilt it over for the moment so you can see it. So this is the board we're concerned with. This down here is the area um, of the uh, preamps and amps before they go off out on these connectors on the back. Down here are the two little resistors that had burned. Um, and that I replaced. And they're still all looking colorful and healthy. So we can zoom in a little bit on those. So there you go, these two guys here. Let me move the lighting over. There we go. Um, okay, so these two guys have been changed. Uh, and they haven't burned again. Um, so I gotta check all around here and see what's going on. Um, the two resistors for the other channel are up here. They're, they're sort of in the shade, hard to see them. I don't know if I can get my lighting close enough. Okay, there's two tiny little burned resistors there, which are exactly the uh, counterparts of these guys down here. So this board here is an example of one of the ones that hinges. So it has a hinge at each end, screws at the other end, you undo the screws, the whole board flips down nicely and you can get at both sides. And all the wires go off are almost all the wires that go off along this edge. This guy is, as you can see, there are no hinges. It's screwed down everywhere. Um, and if, you, if I show you underneath, I don't know to what extent this is visible here, but it is literally a mass of wires that connect directly from different points on the circuit board onto different controls all over the place. So, you can't move this board at all. Um, which is what makes me think this guy was under the influence of hallucinogenics or something when he was putting this design together. Because it is literally a nightmare. Um, so, I changed these two resistors up here because they're accessible and you can get at this piece of the board here. So, I'm hoping I can get this channel sorted out. Um, once I get that done, I'm going to have to be really creative about how I get to the other end of this board over here to uh, replicate the problem, uh, replicate the fix over there. Um, so there we go, that's where the hunt is at the moment, around this section here. Um, and get one channel going, and once I've figured out what it is, uh, then just hopefully replicate the uh, same fix for the other channel. Um, Slightly again frustrating is you on some there's lots of diodes everywhere and most of them a lot of them are Zener diodes uh, And in some of them on the drawing it says uh, 3 volt which I presume is a 3 volt Zener diode and then in other places It just gives you a, a part number 
but you know like an an SE Labs partner it doesn't tell you anything about what it's supposed to be in terms of value. Um, so that's going to be good fun. Um, anyway, <laughs> okay, there we go. So I'm going to keep at this, and we're going to get this fixed. Um, as I say, it's all discrete electronic, all discrete semiconductors. There's a few little primitive, if you like, 7400 series uh, TTL uh, chips. You know your your typical quad NAND gates and stuff. But apart from that, as you can see, it's millions of three-legged fuses everywhere, um, which is such fun to work on. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm going to get stuck in. Um, I think the best way to do it is I'm going to have to put it back in its case so I can fire it up live and then with my other scope signal trace this whole area here. So first thing first I thought let's see how that 60 volt supply is doing um, since that might be part of the culprit. Um, and so since it says all measurements in the thing in the book are we with an AVO8 I'll uh, certainly put DC volts. I'll use an AVO8 so we're set on DC 100 volts. That looks, I don't know if you can see that, but that looks to be just about as a as spot on 60 as we're going to get. Interestingly, I did measure it before with the, with the Fluke Digital and it comes out at 66. So, um, but so I'm happy with that because as I said all the measurements in the drawings are done using one of these guys. Okay so that's that so the next thing I need to do is rig up a signal going into channel 1 uh, and then scope around here and see what the hell is going on. Not sure when the next clip is going to be because uh, as I, s I have guests coming who arrive tomorrow and are going to be here for a week um, and so, uh, yeah, I may not get back to the bench for a little while, um, but yeah, at least um, I've made a little bit more progress on this than last time out. Uh, and very often with these type of projects, I just have to put them away for a while and then come back to them. Although two years is a long time to put them away. Anyway, more to come soon. <laughs>